good evening everybody i am immensely delighted to welcome you all to this webinar this has already become one of the most popular international webinars as you can see from the nationalities of the attendees we all know it is easy to put a baby on ventilator but tonight we have with us dr gilemi santana a leading and popular neonatologist to talk to us on the art of taking a baby out of the ventilator on behalf of iap neocon and nnf kerala we welcome you sir and we are grateful that you could join us in spite of your busy schedule we have two eminent neonatologists from india to moderate the session dr admiral professor girish gupta he is a close friend of mine and dr surendra singh bis we have great pleasure in welcoming both of you to this webinar no webinar is a success without the attendees we welcome all those who took time out of their busy schedule to join us tonight have a wonderful webinar over to the moderators dr girish gupta and dr surendra singh uh, thank you dr ravinder uh, and manoj vishnu ashwin everybody from nnf kerala and ip thrissur for giving us this opportunity um as uh, the order given by admiral girish gupta sir i i am just trying to uh, tell the uh, why extubation failure is so so common and uh, like uh, the the non invasive ventilation is coming up so fast in and in india we feel that niv can take care of all the babies but in extremely preterms uh, niv cpap is not um, uh, a success in many more than 50% sometimes and uh, you do require intubation and when you have intubated a baby uh, extubating it becomes a challenge and um, the main idea of uh, this uh, uh, talk is probably to to take out the tube as early as possible as told by dr ravinder so i really hope to learn great uh, things from dr gelerman Giller, dr uh, gupta sir surgical surgeon admiral dr gupta <laughs> uh, yeah. thank you uh, my colleague uh, moderator dr bes it is my very pleasant duty to introduce one of the authority in the domain on the topic which dr bes has just mentioned and to introduce this the speaker is dr galarme saint anna now he is a very handsome doctor you can see that both physically and intellectually if you look at his research you will realize that today is a very very special opportunity that we all the awaiting speak audience is going to listen from the authority on the subject well it's uh, very nice to go through his cv it's a pretty long but i'll just pick up something which is milestones in his life he is from brazil he did uh, his uh, residency graduation from that place and then he was also a neonatologist over there in year 2001 he moved to mcgill university there he did his phd and phd on in respiratory physiology something which is very very fundamental in today's talk and then he continued over there as a fellow in neonatal and perinatal medicine for a couple of years and then he decided to move to another great place the mcmasters and he worked there for a fairly good time of four years and then he brought out lot of names which possibly had friendship or connection over there and which are that lot of indians which who are there in back masters and canada must have been a, a great company to him and they must have learned a lot from him but then he thought that his alma mater where he did his phd he thought of coming back to that place and he came again to mcgill university and i think from 2009 he is serving there as associate professor he could be just associate professor but once you see his areas of research interest the publication all that he is no, no less than a professor emeritus if you really see that now if i just describe some of his fundamental areas of interest and you would understand that how important they are his love is in the respiratory pathophysiology and the assistance of respiratory support into the preterm baby so something which is very fundamental and he is involved in various projects one of them is the expert project which is a cihr funded project it's a huge project and it means that it is a project for extremely preterm infants on respiratory support 
Now, basically, it deals that how a baby could be taken from a respiratory support to no support. So there's a fundamental aspect. And there he's going to emphasize a lot. I'm sure we would be all very eager to learn this. And not only this, then he's also working on an automated system for prediction of extubation readiness, which is again very, very fundamental. And if we have knowledge about it, see how much good we are going to do that. He has worked on, there is something prime study and NEMO. And his focus, main focus area is that he is in love with prediction of extubation in preterms. Peri extubation policies, SOPs. And he also works beyond that in birth asphyxia, maybe other protocols and support. I would not uh, talk much about it because the topic is very important. And uh, such a, as I said, uh, such a you know, handsome, uh, professionally and comprehensively speaker is there. So with this uh, initial few introductory remarks, I welcome and request Dr. Bilarme Santana to please proceed with your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Gupta. Uh, thank you, Bisht. And uh, thank you everybody for the invitation uh, to participate in such incredible webinar series. I've never seen something organized in, in like that, you know, it's impressive. Um, thank you for the very nice introduction. You know, it's probably the best introduction I, somebody has ever done. Um, and I hope I can um, um, share with you some of the knowledge we, we acquired over the last, I would say 10, 15 years in this very complex area of extubation uh, of the tiny babies, the small babies, uh, uh, they are a challenge for us to take them off the ventilator once they, they need to be intubated. So um, I congratulate all of you uh, for this organization. This is again, very impressive and I'm very happy to be here today and chat with you. It's, it's a huge area of research and uh, I would say that neonatologists is still at the very beginning in, in better understanding what happens with these patients, why some of them fail, why some of them do well. Uh, but I'm gonna go over the next 45, 50 minutes uh, uh, over a presentation uh, on the studies we have done uh, and some other ones have done on that area. And I hope that we're gonna uh, have a better understanding. Uh, of course, we're not gonna solve the problem, but uh, we're gonna have a better understanding of the, the subject. So let me share with you my presentation. Um, and I hope, I think you can see it now. Uh, I put the title on extubation failure, art, gamble, or science. Uh, and as you will see over uh, the next slides, there's a lot of what we do um, when we are disconnecting babies from the ventilator, that's pretty much art experience, clinical expertise. Uh, we do gamble quite uh, with the numbers because they are in our favor, but when they are not in our favor, uh, it becomes really complicated. And hopefully, and thankfully, uh, we are quite much more science into that uh, over the last 10, 15 years. I have no financial relationships to disclose. I have no conflict of interest to resolve. Um, so basically no pharmaceutical industry has ever uh, thought that I'm interested in an interesting speaker, so I'm free of any of interest. Uh, I do wanna disclose a lot of people who helped me and still help me uh, on many of the studies I will be presenting to you today with some Shalish. Um, he's a neonatologist that works with us. Uh, he's now a PhD, he finished his PhD um, in July and an assistant professor of pediatrics at McGill, Samantha, she did a master with us and she's doing a PhD now. Um, many medical students uh, worked with us in a few of the projects. Uh, Hilao, when he was a pediatric resident at McGill, um, people from biomedical engineer, as you will see on the, on the, during the presentation, we developed some interesting collaborations. So basically these guys are the guys who did most of the work and I get the glory to be here talking and presenting to you. So why uh, extubation uh, failure? Um, well, from observation, uh, we know there's a very high percentage of extremely preterm infants that end up 
mechanically ventilated. So no matter what, like it was said very well in the introduction, no matter what we do uh, in terms of NIP, PV, CPAP, uh, less invasive factor and, and et cetera, uh, when we talk about babies less than a thousand, a high percentage end up uh, needing uh, intubation and mechanical ventilation. We also know as a fact that extubation failure rates are very high in this population. For those that have never paid attention on that, uh, extremely low birth rate infants have, depending on the definitions, extubation failure rates that can go as high as 60%. Uh, and if you compare that with children in the PICU, um, their extubation failure rate is around 6%. And adults is around 10%. If you look into neurocritical adult ICUs or cardiac ICUs, that can go up to 20 or 25%. And adults are very worried about extubation failure because of those numbers. So we have a population that has uh, three times higher extubation failure rate. And uh, for a long time, uh, it seemed to me that we are not really paying attention in that problem. And thankfully, uh, in the last 10, 15 years, I've seen a lot of groups, different groups doing research on the subject, which kind of helped a lot in their understanding. So, uh, but I would say that we still need more robust science to help on the decisions because uh, as an neonatologist, many times, and you, you uh, here uh, watching this presentation will find yourself in situations that are very similar that we don't know for sure if it's the right time to take this baby off the machine or not. I'll give you an example of a case that I'm gonna use to outline my presentation. So let's say a male baby uh, that's born at 10 p.m. Uh, at 24 weeks and four days, it's almost 25 weeks, 680 grams and got complete antenatal steroids. So this baby in our place, no matter he's a 24 and a 600, he's tried on bubble CPAP in the delivery room. But at 20 minutes of life, the baby oxygen needs is pretty high. Uh, he's retracting a lot. So this child was intubated, surfactant was given, uh, the lung disease was quite significant and he was initiated on mechanical ventilation. Uh, next day at rounds, which is about 12 hours of life, it's 10 a.m. on rounds, the ventilator settings of these kids are 12 over five, uh, ventilated with a volume guarantee of five cc per kilo on a backup rate of 40. The FIO2 is 28%, so less than 30%, with a mean away pressure between seven uh, and six. When the resident comes to you and show a blood gas they have done in the morning and the pH is 733 uh, with a CO2 of 45, a good oxygenation, normal by car, normal base excess. So on rounds, those are the questions that will come to you. Should we excavate this baby? Based on what? When? Uh, now? If not now, at what age? What are the chances of a successful extubation if we do it? Oh, as a matter of fact, what is a successful extubation? Is extubation failure if the baby fails a problem? And if it is a problem, and if you convince me that if this baby fails, it, it's a big problem for this baby, is there any way we can decrease extubation failure or predict this baby is gonna fail and therefore no, we don't extubate him now. So let's try to go over some of the, uh, those questions. Uh, I can promise you for some of them, we have a few answers. For some of them, we still don't. So uh, a few years ago, um, in a collaboration with Peter Davis, Gene Dempsey, and some other centers and Martin Kessler in the US, we did a, a large international survey on practices around extubation in these extremely preterm babies. So one of the questions was in your unit, uh, extremely preterm infants are extubated based on what criteria? And as you can see here, the vast majority of the people that replied uh, said it's based on the ventilator settings I just presented to you, um, blood gases I just presented to you, uh, and clinical and hemodynamically stability. And the case I presented the baby uh, was very uh, stable. Uh, about 50% at that time said, um, well, to be extubated, he needed to be on caffeine in the last 24 hours. 
And around 20% said, oh, he needs to pass a spontaneous breathing trial. And I'm gonna go back to SBGs uh, uh, later in this presentation. So um, if we are going to extubate based on those criteria, uh, when do you extubate those babies? And as you can see here, and I left the 76% to keep, to stay in your mind first, the vast majority, three quarters of the reply, the respondents said that these babies, extremely preterm babies should be extubated in the first three days of life. So 18% immediately after surfactant is given, 22% in the first day of life, that give, gives you a 40%, and another 36% in the first three days of life, which is this baby is, uh, is there, he's in the 12 hours of life. So, um, so one thing is what people say they do, the other thing is what really happens. So we decided to look into the literature that was published to see what was the age of at first extubation of this population of ELBWs. Uh, we found out it's very variable across the literature. And the other thing that we found, it's not always reported. Many studies don't even say uh, when was the first extubation attempted. But we look into to the big trials recently published, the COIN, the NIPPV, the SUPPORT trial, and most of kids are extubated around three days of life or median of 3.5 going from two to seven, median of 2.5 going from two to nine. So these kids are mostly extubated in practice, not in when you reply us to a survey, between three and seven days of life. So that's, but the median values of all literature uh, ranged between anything of 2.5 days up to 36 days of life. So just keep in mind that one thing is what people say uh, you should do. The other thing is what you really do in, uh, in clinical practice. So if we decided uh, to extubate this baby, what are the chances of a successful extubation in this case? Uh, and what is a successful extubation by definition? So um, this is a study done by Brett Manley in Australia a few years ago in a high flow in nasal cannula, and they did a sub-analysis of the study. And as you can see, extubation success in percentage goes down as you go down in the gestational age. And this is very intuitive. And just to illustrate to you that for babies between 23 and 24 weeks, which is the case of, uh, I presented to you, extubation success is around 30%. And that's why one of the words in the title of this presentation is gamble. Because if you have, if you take 30% chances of success, that means that you have a 70% chances of failure. You still have some chances of success. So people can take it or not take it, depending on a few factors I'll be talking to you um, as we go along in this presentation. But it's higher. For sure, uh, the chances of uh, failure is higher as you are more and more uh, immature or has a lower birth weight. So, what? How do we define? Uh, if you want to say that you have you have extubated this baby and this baby was successfully extubated, well, there are a few questions that arise. Uh, what is what are the criteria used to define successful failure? Uh, and that criteria, of course, passed by the observation window you selected. So let's take a look into that. Go back into the survey we have done a few years ago. Uh, another question is, uh, in your center, and this is a survey about peri-extubation practices, uh, do you have specific criteria for extubation failure? And in that time, we asked specifically not failure being re-intubation. And surprisingly, uh, almost 90% of the respondents said, well, it's based on clinical judgment of the responsible physician, which pretty much opens a very high variability uh, on what's going to happen. Uh, only 15% replied saying, yes, we do have a defined reintubation criteria. So this is one of the problems, again, I will be addressing later uh, in most of the units, which is the lack of well-defined protocols 
for many aspects of respiratory care. And here uh, it's winning from mechanical ventilation and disconnecting from mechanical ventilation. There are a few uh, definition criteria that has been published. This is uh, Clyde Wright in June of Pediatrics in 2016, basically looking for some of the trials and the CPAP failure criteria or uh, the intubation criteria they use. And if you put all of them together, again, it's quite variable. FIO2 range from 30 to more than 75% to be considered failure. Uh, the number of apneas from one to more than four per hour to be considered a failure. The initial CPAP pressure uh, being more than equal four to being more than equal eight centimeters of water to be considered a failure. So it's, uh, if you look across the literature, um, not, not only there's a high variability on the age, they get extubated, but a high variability on the criteria people use to put them back into the veins later. And one of the variability uh, and the discussions that's pretty is too open in the air is the observation window selected. Um, so uh, this is a systematic review. Um, and again, it's Peter Davies was, was involved on that with Barbara Smith and Eric Jensen from Philadelphia. But they looked on definitions of extubation success in very preterm babies. So what I would like to show and highlight to you here is that um, if you look at babies more than a thousand grams uh, and you use 24 hours, we intubated in 24 hours or we intubated in 48 hours or we intubated in 72 hours, you see that the, the number of failures keep going up, up to 72 hours, but then it goes down after that. So it's kind of, there is a plateau here and the window of 72 hours for these babies more than a thousand grams seem to capture all the real failures. But interesting, they also look into the same for babies born with less than equal 1,000 grams per study that was published. And as the studies were keeping increasing uh, the window between extubation and reintubation, you see the percentage of failure keeps going up. So when they use the definition of seven days after extubation, you still have a higher when you compare to three days. So you always wonder if you define extubation failure, okay, to whoever gets reintubated in three days, you're gonna miss some that got reintubated on day four or five or seven for respiratory reasons. And the four um, perhaps should be considered a failure. We asked people around based on that systematic review, we included that question in our survey. What is the time frame? Uh, you use to define extubation failure. And as you can see, again, the vast majority uh, was in the first three days of life, just a very small percentage prolonged the window. So when people are talking about extubation failure uh, in meetings and most of the places, they probably are using reintubation in the first three days after extubation. So the problem is uh, in the choice of the observation window is if you use a too short window, you may miss, like I said, reintubations that are related to respiratory causes. Or some people may argue that if you use too long of a window, you may capture reintubation that had nothing to do uh, with respiratory reasons like infection or necrotizing enterocolitis or babies intubated for elective surgical procedures. So we, we decided to look into that more deeply. Uh, as we were conducting the APEX study, uh, in, and after we get close to 200 patients in the study, we decided to look into the patterns of reintubation in extremely preterm infants in a longitudinal cohort. So um, we first, because we could know in the APEX, we collected information on the causes of reintubation. So we had babies reintubated for respiratory reasons and babies reintubated for non-respiratory related reasons. And for the respiratory related reasons, uh, we the most common causes of reintubations. The number one is apnea and bradycardia after extubation. Uh, and then increase F5-2 is the second one. And then increase work of breathing or respiratory acidosis. And this is, they don't sum 100 because you could check more than one cause. So uh, in total, now 
in the whole cohort of patients and we capture reintubations that happen at any point between extubation up to 14 days after extubation, 68% of the reintubations were respiratory related and 32% were non-respiratory related, well, whether the baby developed an infection, had a GI complication and had to go for surgery, for example, a hernia repair or some other thing. So, but, so then we specific look into the time frame between uh, extubation and reintubation and the cause of the reintubation. And uh, here we separated in respiratory reintubations and non-respiratory reintubations. And in the x-axis is the time. So that's 72 hours after, seven days, 10 days, 14 days, and we keep going on uh, after the extubation when the babies got intubated. And what was the reason? It was that respiratory related or non-respiratory related. And so when we plot the probability of the reintubation over time, you see that most of the reintubations in blue uh, are in blue in the first week to 10 days after extubation, which means they are respiratory related as expected. So we break it down and say, if you use a window of less than equal seven days, basically you will be capturing 90% of the uh, reintubations related to respiratory problems. There's a bit of contamination of non-respiratory related. Uh, if you go in, uh, in a window more than 14 days, means that most of the reintubations are not respiratory related. The problem is between 18 to 14 days, it's, it can go either way. Some kids still have uh, reintubations for respiratory reasons. So basically, an observation window of seven days would capture around 80% of respiratory related reintubations with less than 15% contamination of non respiratory reintubations. So then, um, so if you can come up with a consensus on uh, what is a reintubation, uh, what is an extubation failure and the time window we're gonna use for that. The next question is if this baby fail, is it a problem? Uh, why we're we talking so much about that subject? So that question was also in the, in the survey, is extubation failure? We asked for the people in all the units. I think in total, we, we got reply from 168 units from US, Australia, Europe, uh, and Canada. Uh, and most of the people, and then that's when the replies were quite divided. 40% said, yes, uh, it is a risk factor associated with mortality and morbidity. There was another 35% that said, no, uh, has nothing to do with increased mortality and morbidity. morbidity and there's about 20% that said they were not sure. So we know that the procedure aspect of intubation is not always easy. You know? intubate a 700 gram baby uh, has been associated with adverse uh, effects, especially uh, if there's an emergency intubation, changes in brain activity, airway trauma, hemodynamic instability, even death has been associated with these procedures. So it's not an extremely simple procedure when you talk about this fragile and small population. We also know from secondary analysis of two large randomized trials, uh, that extubation failure has been suggested as an independent uh, factor associated with all these undesired outcomes, like death prior to discharge, BPG among survivors, death of BPG, IVH three and four, prolonged respiratory support, length of hospitalization, increased ROP, and etc. So what? It, what exactly increases the risk of morbidity uh, if you fail an, an extubation? Is the reintubation itself, like I pointed out, the procedure is not free of complications, or is the resumption of mechanical ventilation? And the other question that came to us in this journey of 10, 15 years looking into the subject is do all reintubations have the same clinical implication? Let's say if you, extubate a baby and he failed in 24 hours, is it the same uh, compared to a baby that you extubate and take five days to be reintubated? So again, we decided to look into that. First, we did some search 
uh, on the literature. And there's this very interesting uh, paper published by Eric Jensen and Kevin Dysart from CHOP in Philadelphia that did a database analysis of 3,343 babies, less than 1,000, that had been intubated in those centers and received mechanical ventilation. Uh, and they showed there was an increased risk of BPG associated with the duration of mechanical ventilation. Uh, the interesting data that comes from the study is that 66% is two in three of these babies needed reintubation uh, of, the, uh, of the, the whole population. That's 2,206 babies. And again, 60% of those 66%, which is 1,000, 323 required a total of more than equal three reintubations. So which means that if you fail once, you are more likely to fail a second time or a third time. So if you do the math, 40% of the total population were reintubated more than equal three times. And this was also independently associated with BPG. So there are two limitations in their fantastic study. Uh, one, they did not account for the age at first extubation. So uh, you would imagine that if your baby is extubated in 10 hours or 12 hours of life, like the case, or if he's extubated in five days or seven days, maybe there is a difference. Uh, also, they did not account for the time to reintubation. Uh, if they are reintubated quickly, or if it takes about five days to be reintubated or seven days. So those are uh, limitations that we decided to look into our cohort to see if we could help uh, in answer those questions. So first we look at the age of extubation and the morbidity. So when we got to 196 babies on apex, we divided uh, those babies in early extubation. So babies that had been extubated between one and seven days of life, which was about 58% of them, late extubation, uh, babies extubated between 8 and 35, and there's a few, 8%, that were never extubated up to 35 days, so we did not analyze. So the early extubation was divided in success or failure, and the late extubation was also divided in success or failure. And after adjusting for several confounders, and we presented that at PAS uh, two years ago, infants with early extubation and failure they had significantly greater odds of death BPG, BPG among survivors and days of oxygen therapy when you compare to the group with successful extubation, either if they were extubated early or late at any time during the first 35 days of life. So in other words, it's better based on the data presented here that you are extubated a little bit later, but with success than earlier, but you fail. So the question is, can we know who is gonna fail or not? And I'll come back to that uh, later. We also looked into the time to the intubation and the outcome of death of VPG. So those are pretty undesired outcomes. And uh, when we did the uh, analysis and we used two models, in the first model, we just look for the time to reintubation. But in the second one, we control uh, time to reintubation plus duration of mechanical ventilation, like in the paper, from Philadelphia. And as you can see here, uh, and the reference is the dashed line. So these are the babies that were successfully extubated. The babies that failed had a higher incidence of death or BPG, uh, no matter what time they fail after extubation, up to 28 days. But if they do fail in the first 48 hours, there was a striking increase in the adjusted odds ratio of death or BPG. So, which means that now maybe there is an effect and there is a difference between failed uh, quick or failed a little bit later. So if you fail in the first 48 hours, it seems that it, that here is a much high morbidity to your patient. So in summary, uh, exposure to mechanical ventilation remains one of the most important risk factors for uh, death of VPG. But we also need to be mindful that multiple reintubations independently can affect that. Reintubations within the first 48 hours can independently affect that. 
and failure of extubation in the first seven days beginning of your life, it's also different than if you fail later. So finally, so if we could come up with those uh, knowledge, uh, acquire those knowledge and become more uh, scientific uh, into the approach of this problem. Now, is there any way we can decrease extubation failure? Or second, can we predict failure in these patients and before we can avoid those uh, outcomes? So one way that I would just, there are many ways, but one I, I want to highlight is a study that we have done at McMaster many years ago uh, on the implementation of respiratory therapies driven protocol. So basically, uh, like I said at the beginning of my presentation, that protocol helped establish what are the criteria to extubate a baby based on birth weight, and what are the criteria to reintubate. And that has really made an interesting impact in the outcomes, as you will see. Before the protocol, we had a 40% extubation failure rate defined as reintubation in the first 72 hours. After the protocol, that went down to 25% in the first year, and then went further down in the second year to 20%, which means the effect was sustained, was not just an immediate impact of the protocol, but that impact stayed there. So, and there are interventions uh, that also can improve rates of successful extubation. This is a fantastic systematic review of meta-analysis done by, by the group in Melbourne, Australia, where they show that preterm infants should be extubated to some sort of non-invasive support. They should get caffeine before extubation and steroids may help, uh, especially in babies that have high chances of DPG. Uh, and the same group, uh, published an editorial in Journal of Pediatrics called Solving the Equation of Extubation. Uh, and then they highlight that two important issues remain for research and clinician. Like I said, you know, accurate tests of extubation redness can we predict, or some tool that can enable clinicians to minimize the duration while avoiding the risk of reintubation. So you want to take the baby off the machine, but remain of the machine. So predictors of extubation redness have been studied in neonatology for a long time. There is a bunch of uh, studies published. So we decided to do a systematic review and meta-analysis of diagnostic test accuracy. So our objective was to identify predictors of extubation success and determine the accuracy compare to judgment, clinical judgment alone. So. Um, we observed that tests were performed in many different ways with durations going from a few seconds to 24 hours, uh, from peak levels of zero to six centimeters of water and using very variable clinical and physiological measurements during the tests. In total, we found that 31 predictors were included, uh, uh, were done, were studied and included in the meta-analysis and I apologize for the busy slide. So those are all the studies and the tests. And we provide the sensitivity specificity uh, and the cumulative and with the coefficient interval here. And as you can see, the specificity with the ability to, def to detect to you know this baby will be a failure is very uh, poor. So in summary, uh, there is a lack of strong evidence to support the use of those predictors because they have very low accuracy. And basically they add no benefit in the identification of extubation failures when you compare to the clinical judgment alone. So larger and more standardized studies are necessary. So as we we're going um, on the APEX, uh, by design, the APEX study had a five minutes of endotracheal CPAP before extubation. And the reason why we had these five minutes that we put the baby on endotracheal CPAP was not to perform an SBT, but just to capture their breathing without the interference of the peak pressure uh, of the ventilator. But since we had the data, and during that time we measure a lot of things, we decided to take a look uh, and describe uh, the clinical event, what happened during those five minutes of endotracheal CPAP, which it's kind of an SBT that people do in clinical practice. 
So we, we basically established four clinical events that could happen during the endotracheal CPAP, one being apnea, requiring stimulation. Uh, the other one is the presence and cumulative duration of bradycardia, defined as heart rate less than 100. Then the next one is the presence and cumulative duration of desaturation, defined as a SpO2 less than 85. And the fourth one is the need of increased oxygen supplementation and the maximum amount provided. So 259 babies at that time have been extubated on APEX. 184 successfully and 75 failed. And this is the breakdown. Uh, 145 of these babies had some clinical event during that five minutes endotracheal CPAP. 39 only one event, 63 two events of those four, 26 three events and 19 all four events. So with significant variations in how uh, the assessors reacted to those clinical events. The advantage of APEX as a perspective study because we had detailed information on everything that happened in the peri-extubation failure uh, phase. So in total, uh, we came up, uh, we wanted to know if there is any definition of SVT that can really help in the prediction of extubation failure. So we use machine learning methodology uh, all those events and everything that happened. And we came up with 41,602 different definitions of pass or failure. And we evaluated them in terms of their accuracy. So overall, they have very high sensitivity, but very low specificity. And this is the performance of those spontaneous breathing tests. And also what we saw is that these five minutes and the tracheal CPAP exposed more than 50%, like I show you the numbers, to some sort of clinical instability. Uh, so why am I gonna do a five minute spontaneous breathing trial if I'm gonna expose more than half of the babies to some clinical instability, it can be apnea, desaturation, bradycardia, increased FiO2, if that has a very low specificity to identify for me babies that will fail. So in summary, the current predictors of extubation redness, they lack accuracy, and they are no better than clinical judgment alone. Uh, furthermore, we don't know the optimal duration of a spontaneous breathing trial and the amount of support that should be used uh, if we are gonna use that, and I strongly recommend to not use that. So no single test, uh, and from, for us, this was not surprising because no single test can capture the complex nature of why infants fail extubation. Every infant is different. So therefore, we think that we need a more complex, individualized tool that can capture more intrinsic biological variables. So we know there is a variability in biological signals. Too little variability or too much variability are indicators of poor health. Uh, changes in variability occur when you get sicker or better. Uh, so we decided to um, capture some biological signals and see if those signals could be used and help the prediction of extubation redness. So basically we capture the heart rate, uh, the ribcage and abdominal movements and oxygen saturation. In a pilot study, we have showed that heart rate variability is significantly lower in babies that ext failed extubation. We also have showed that re increased respiratory variability in the chest wall movement and decreased breathing variability was also associated with increased failure. And we put, when we put all both of them together, the heart rate variability and the respiratory variability and use a support vector machine uh, 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 evaluation basically with the computer science people. It's kind of an artificial intelligence analysis where you, you do a lot of training. Uh, you give the tracings to the computer and train uh, the computer to identify failure or success. Uh, the computer very, very, had a very high accuracy in the training and the testing phase to classify failures correctly. So it's about 80%. So uh, in that cohort, 42% failed. 
extubation. So if 42% of babies fail uh, and the computer have a precision of 80%, so that means that your rate of extubation failure will drop from 42% to 8%. So if you get the example of the support trial where 388 babies failed extubation and you have a test that will tell with certainty 80% of those failures, that will drop this number from 388 to 77 failures, preventing 311 failures and preventing 124 babies to have more than equal three reintubations. So that looks great. The problem is that the accuracy with the success was not as good. So if, which means that it would result in a delay of some infants who could otherwise have been successfully extubated. So some babies that the machine said would be a failure, they were successfully extubated. So then we moved into the biggest study, which was the APEX multicenter trial, because we had that pilot data and we had all these um, uh, new knowledge on the subject. So we were able to put a lot of centers together and develop with the aim to develop an individualized, automated and objective predictor of extubation readiness. And here, using a combination of clinical variables, in other words, eight pages of clinical data and quantitative measurements of cardiorespiratory behavior. So we developed this portable lab that would go to the bedside and collect the cardiorespiratory data. And at the same time, uh, our research assistant, PhD students collected a lot of information about the babies. And what we did, uh, we did cardiorespiratory signal analysis. All these analyses were automated with no interference from anybody and blinded. So basically the engineers did not know who was a failure or not and integrated with clinical parameters to come up with what we call a cardiorespiratory feature set. So basically it's putting uh, both informations together. Then give that to the machine learning people that got this cardiorespiratory feature set and apply machine learning methodology. They use a two-step classifier to classify, to see if the machine could classify uh, babies in success or failure and then test the accuracy of the machine. So the step one uh, was to define the high risk population. So basically a clinical automated classifier that basically uh, draw a line here, they capture all the red, the red dots of the extubation failure. All the babies that failure, fail at extubation are within this rectangle, this box here. So everybody else here that uh, had a gestational age more than 28 weeks and four days, or a weight of extubation more than 100 and, uh, 1,100 grams were successfully extubated. So these patients were not included in the step two of the classifier. And in the step two of the classifier, we use balanced random force forest classifier, leaving one out uh, methodology, and then come up with the classification of success or failure. Uh, and then we looked at the performance of the classifier uh, by, uh, uh, by developing the area under the curve, the ROC curve. So I'm presenting to you what we showed at the PS last year. Now we have finished the study, so the number is 241. So at that time we had 207, 83% uh, successfully extubated and 17%, 36 babies that failed. And these are the baseline characteristics of these patients, of course, population that failed are smaller in gestational age, has lower birth weight, uh, more, uh, a little bit more uh, intubation in the delivery room, and they were extubated at uh, higher FiO2, higher CO2, and they had higher, uh, lower uh, postmenstrual age and weight. So, um, so then the cardiorespiratory feature set, when the, we use machine learning methodology that came up with the classifier with the best performance, use 20 features. And basically five were respiratory. So basically five came from the respiratory signal, 11 from the heart rate signal, and only four were, were clinical parameters. 
and this is the assigned weights for them. So 50% of the best classifier use respiratory related signals. And the classification um, and the performance of the classifier had a sensitivity of, this is the ROC curve of 0.8 with the specificity of 0.78, which means that uh, almost like in the pilot study would classify correctly almost 80% of the failures as a failure, but unfortunately with a low uh, negative predictive value. So what that means in terms of diagnostic value, that means that 80% of successful extubations were identified correctly. 78% of failed extubations were identified correctly by the classifier. So what is the clinical value of that? Uh, if you think as a physician uh, and you have decided that these babies, because all these babies have been decided by the physician, they're ready to be extubated when we went there and did the instrumentation and collected it. So if the physician decide the baby is ready for extubation and Apex agree with the physician, which happened in 70% of the cases, you have a 94% successful extubation rate. Only eight patients were incorrectly classified by the classifier. If the physician decide that the baby is ready for extubation, but the Apex classifier disagree with the physician, basically say, no, this is going to be a fail. 28% uh, were correctly classified by the apex and 34 incorrected. So that means that for every true failure prevented, approximately one baby uh, with success is not extubated. So it's the question is this trade-off acceptable? So uh, infants were deemed ready for extubation but classified as failure. So what is the cost of staying on ventilator longer compared to the cost of failure? So that should be the question that clinicians should ask themselves. So the cost of staying uh, longer in the ventilator, we don't know because as by design, all infants were extubated in apex. There's very limited evidence. Only one small study that was done many years ago by Dana looking to uh, prolonging 24 hours extubation compared to extubating right away and show no difference in outcomes. The cost of fail on extubation, we have talked about that in this presentation. Uh, we had three kids in the apex that we uh, consider high cost for failure. These three infants died within hours from elective extubation. This is published in Journal of Pediatrics in 2018. So basically one developed a fulminant pulmonary hemorrhage, one a massive IVH after extubation, and one a fulminant neck, which was a few hours after extubation. And remember this was planned elective extubation. So I think, you know, and I'm gonna um, show you Martin Tobin um, editorial uh, on uh, extubation black boxes and ontology something that he says that it's very important. The challenge of medicine is not about taking, most, taking care of most patients who do well, irrespective of the methods we employ. But instead, the goal is to take feasible steps that might have a high likelihood of avoiding undesirable or catastrophic outcomes in a small number of uh, patients. Actually, it is to take data generated in group of patients and determine how to best apply the information in a single patient being managed at a given moment in time. So we, when we did a post-hoc analysis of those numbers, not, and we, go, we went back to see if Apex classifier has detected that three babies that died. Uh, and indeed the three infants that died were correctly classified as a failure by Apex, which means that Physician thought the baby would be okay to be extubated. The classifier said no, and these babies were extubated and died. So if you flip the coin, that means that for every 10 infants incorrectly classified, the classifier apex correctly identified one extubation failure that end up dying. So is this trade-off acceptable? 
So precision medicine uh, now, I hope, is moving into neonatal respiratory care. The challenge, as Dr. Bankalai said in an editorial in 2017, is to find the right indication and timing for both invasive and non-invasive support during the resp respiratory course of each infant. So the future is that, no, we cannot just use art and certainly we don't wanna gamble with those lives. We need well-designed studies using clear definitions of what is an extubation failure and testing the safety and efficacy of individualized interventions on short and long-term outcomes in these patients. So here are the, uh, the take home messages I wanna leave with you. Neonatology, us, uh, we are invasively ventilating smaller and smaller and more and more immature babies as we gain confidence with non-invasive. Now we just put on the ventilator the most high risk patients. The decision uh, about best time to take them off is difficult. Uh, since both prolonged mechanical ventilation and multiple reintubations are undesirable outcomes. So we need uh, accurate bedside predictors of extubation readiness in this population. The extubation equation is quite complex. Uh, infants are reintubated at highly variable time frames and for uh, diverse etiologies. Both early and successful not just early extubations associated with the most favorable outcomes. I think it's time to evolve in patient diagnosis from art to science. Patients are diagnosed based on history, clinical exam, and laboratory reports that are interpreted in the light of clinical experience and medical literature. And I highly value that clinical experience. But now artificial intelligence is bringing insight from the population level to the individual or care. You know, I think in the future, we need to have better instrumentation for data acquisition, uh, use more friendly uh, data acquisition like wireless um, acquisition. So we don't need to put all these bands around, but we can capture. Uh, and this is an interesting paper from Chicago using uh, wearable wireless devices that can capture the signals and send it to the machines to help you. We need to develop prediction models to prevent intubations with the highest risk, in the highest risk population. Uh, we finished APEX, the manuscript is under, um, uh, we're writing the manuscript now. Uh, and we need a, we'll need a prospective validation of APEX classifier uh, before any adoption. So we're still like, a, unfortunately, a long uh, way to get there, but we're moving forward for sure. Uh, and at the individualized level, we need to weight the costs of failure against the cost of keeping a baby an extra day or two or an extra few days on the ventilation. And this is very important and has never been uh, truly addressed. We all talk about like take them out of the ventilator. And I agree with that because you no know, prolonged ventilation does affect lung, but some failures are very high cost. So neonatal clinicians, we still have to decide whether clinical actions should be taken at different levels, understanding the possible outcomes in any decision. In the end, any predictor will require that we accept and manage the certainty of uncertainty. Thank you very much uh, for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to all of you and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Professor Santana, uh, it was really great and uh, we got a glimpse of what is over there for, and the body of work which you have, uh, which you have done, and which actually is providing a way to the whole world how extubations need to be planned. Uh, and I see, sir, uh, Dr. Gupta, there are a lot of uh, there are uh, quite a few questions which are actually quite con contextual to our scenarios. Uh, we ah. don't see very small, extremely low birth weight babies as such in most of the. Nikus. So our less than 28 weekers are quite less compared to what you see over there. So our babies are uh, getting managed more with NIVs and the asphyxia um, babies, the asphyxiated babies, uh, they they are actually the ones who are actually requiring it or meconium is a 
a problem with us because of aspiration syndrome with PPHN is the issue which we are grappling with right now. Uh, and uh, I'll just uh, ask you a few of the questions which are I can see over here. In fact, um, our concern is actually uh, how to extubate first. Rather than uh, knowing uh, this also is there, but uh, uh, can you just tell us uh, whether what parry extubation measure do you take? Because for our benefit, for the benefit of the audience who have logged in for uh, at this hour, and they wish to ask you about what is the parry extubation role of steroids, adrenaline, what is the nibulization, um, or a spontaneous uh, respiratory rate kind of things. So uh, I would uh, ask you to tell sure. Me. No, it's a. Uh... It's always important, always important that you present science and you present what you do in practice. You know, it's a, it's very important. So uh, we do have criteria for extubation, like the one we presented. I presented. So if the baby is less than a thousand, it's mean away pressure of seven and FiO two less than thirty percent. And we use mean away pressure because it it does not depend what is the mode of ventilation you are. So if you are AC, SMV, high frequency, it's the mean away pressure of less than seven. Uh, in babies less than a thousand, as far as the FiO2 is less than 30%. For babies more than a thousand, more than equal a thousand, it's a mean away pressure of eight. Uh, and these are babies in, that we try to get them extubated in the first week of life. Uh, so we know that uh, if you go more than a week on the mechanical ventilation, that increases kind of exponentially the chances of lung injury and prolonged ventilation and BPG. Uh, and the chances of extubation success uh, in those babies is also higher when you extubate them in the first week of life. So the question is the first three days versus the first three to seven days uh, in the more fragile, smaller baby. But you know, the, 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 the issue is so complex because it also depends on so many other things. Yeah. It depends on, on the staffing and the experience of the staff in your unit and keep them extubated. So you can get them off the ventilator, but then you have to put them on CPAP or nasal ventilation uh, and some sort of non-invasive respiratory support. Uh, and that also depends on, can your place do that effectively or your place is not doing that effectively. But you know, in, in our unit, in, in, in practical terms, it's the numbers I just told you. We load them with caffeine, we get them off the ventilator, if they mean a way at, at those levels, if I were to at those levels, because we don't have, uh, right now, we still don't have a good projector. Good projector. Uh, Dr. Geme, uh, the other question uh, which Dr. Vijay Krishnan Nair was asking uh, was, uh, because we uh, now have shifted more to NIV and HH HFNP. So uh, how, why uh, wasn't NIV offered uh, to those uh, what he's writing, uh, wasn't NIV offered to reintubate prior to reintubation or those cases were excluded. So uh, I think uh, he's just asking those babies who require reintubation attempts, one, two, and three reintubation attempts, whether NIV was offered to them or whether NIV was yeah, not available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, the studies that I, I presented uh, were several centers in Philadelphia using NIMV. Um, the, the issue about NIPPV being more effective than CPAP after extubation, for me, uh, it's a very complex and difficult um, uh, issue because the systematic reviews have many problems. Uh, they, the people who did the systematic review were very careful in show that we have low to moderate level of evidence. So the evidence that's there is not the best evidence. It, so it's not a closed deal. Uh, many centers like uh, Columbia in New York, now who has the lowest PPG rate and one of the lowest extubation failure rates, they expect everybody to CPAP, to bubble CPAP. So, uh, and the systematic review has like 11 to 12 studies on that systematic review. Only one was a large multi-center trial. All the other ones are small single center studies. Uh, and they've used many different NIMV, many different CPAP. So it's a very high heterogeneity in the systematic review. Therefore, the level of evidence is not strong. So it's still an open question whether you can prevent reintubation or extubation failure by putting an NIMV or not. I, we don't 
electively put them on NINV, we extubate all of them to CPAP. And if they started to have apneas, then we switch them to NIPPV. Uh, and like uh, you know, the extubation failure rate like I presented to you is around 20% in the APEX study. So that means that 80% were successfully extubated. I would say, and I have the data, 70% just got CPAP. Only 10% had to switch from CPAP to NIPPV to be rescued and therefore not get reintubated. So if you extubate everybody to NIPPV as the way to go, that means that 70%, which is of, of the kids that uh, will go on a success, which is almost nine in 10 successful extubation, will get NIPPV when they didn't need it. It's just a CPAP was enough. Oh, that's, uh, that's a different way of putting it up. Uh, that's a great way because NIPB would require actually a ventilator, which is yeah. a coffee machine. And uh, with a country like ours, where NIPB is not possible in most of the centers uh, uh, because ventilators are usually uh, occupied by the babies who require ventilation, proper ventilation. So uh, to provide uh, NIPPV, uh, obviously a larger center with lots of ventilators uh, with NIPP facilities are required. So for, as of now, I think uh, you are suggesting us to uh, be uh, good with, and, uh, with CPAP also because 80% of your extubation will be successful with CPAP or HFNC. Yeah, we actually them all to CPAP. Uh, we, we basically almost never use high flow nasal cannula because uh, in the preterm population, I've done some studies on high flow nasal cannula and uh, I don't see in the preterm population, any advantage of high flow nasal cannula. Now for uh, the acute phase or for the uh, non-acute phase, uh, it does not provide the continuous pressure that you need uh, and you get when you provide CPAP. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of leak and I don't, and maybe, and sometimes there's a risk that the pressure will build up very quickly if there is an obstruction because it's a high flow, it's a jet of flow into the airways. Whereas in the CPAP, no, the CPAP, the flow passes through the nasal prong or the mask. The baby inhales and then exhales. So the baby controls. In the high flow, the flow is jet into the airway of the child. So the baby has no control. And so because it's accelerated flow, if there's any blockage, the pressure can go really high, 15, 20 centimeters of water. So we do, um, we, we almost never use high flow in nasal cannula, only in a few chronic uh, patients that are, are old. We develop a protocol for high flow in nasal cannula. That's basically, there is no indication. So there are the respiratory therapy say, oh, I'm gonna take these machines out of the unit because the, your protocol has no indication. So uh, just uh, two days back, I had uh, a talk uh, with uh, Dr. Amit Gupta from Oxford, uh, Redcliffe uh, Hospital, and uh, there it was the other side of the story. They said we don't are not keeping CPAP machines. Uh, CPAP machines are just lying vacant in Oxford, and we are all converted to HFNC. So there is yeah. two there are two worlds, yeah. two worlds yeah. right now: one who it's believes not, no. and one who doesn't believe. Yeah, uh, no, it's interesting. It's interesting you guys are developing these webinar series, like I said at the beginning, you will get a lot of information, different information, different views, different perspectives. It will be up to you um, to filter and decide uh, which one you're gonna take it. Uh, another is um, a question by uh, Dr. Uh, if Dr. Gupta is not asking uh, about, um, uh, there was anything, another thing like, uh, why did you, what about the con concept of earliest extubation failure to prevent BPD versus wait for 72 hours? I think uh, Dr. Sakir uh, VT, he has understood that you're waiting for 72 hours to, to, to label it as uh, extubation failure. Whereas probably uh, the, the definition of extubation failure, you were restricting to 72 hours and then you uh, uh, took it to one week of extubation failure so that you are actually attributing uh, the success of an extubation uh, to uh, whether it was successful or not. Uh, it is not that you are waiting for 72 hours for a uh, failure to, to be reintubated. No, we're not, we're not waiting. It's a, this is a prospective study. So we just collected when the baby was reintubated. So all the decisions to be reintubated were done by the medical team. We, we could not uh, have any interference. 
So once the baby was reintubated, we just wrote it down. Okay, reintubated at 48 hours or reintubated at 52 hours. So we're not waiting for that. We noticed, so with any prospective observation study, it's observation uh, from clinical practice. So we just noticed that those who got reintubated quick uh, were the ones with higher rates of odds ratio of death or BPG. So which means that, you know, um, the judgment to take them off, and these are all planned extubations. So these are not extubations, accidental extubations. So there's a decision that's made at the bedside was probably off because, the, you know, you took the baby off the ventilator and then 12 hours later, he's being reintubated or a few hours later, there have been some cases that babies were extubated and reintubated in the same procedure because they failed by the way. So, which means that, you know, in some cases, our ability uh, is very um, poor to know this is time to, to get this baby so this is what Actually, I was about to ask also, if the baby gets accidentally extubated, and many of the time they actually go on to... Uh, to do well later. And that is what you have asked. Somebody has uh, uh, Dr. Henry Aziz. I know he's from uh, which part of the world. Sorry, Henry, I don't know about you. But he is asking, does very low uh, level of uh, carbon dioxide indicate immediate extubation? Uh, does one parameter of uh, PCO2 should uh, direct you to extubate? Yeah, it depends on uh, if your CO2 is low because you are blowing it off or because I am iatrogenically doing that, right? Um, so CO2, level of CO2 is not a good predictor of uh, success or failure. But, it's a, but it can certainly uh, ask, tell us to uh, tone, uh, decrease our ventilator settings. Oh, sure, yeah, no, sure. You know, um, you talk about winning. I think winning should be done all the time, a very active, process. So uh, as soon as you have a low CO2, yeah, you need to move on uh, and decrease the ventilator settings to keep um, the physiology as uh, close as possible to normal physiology. We do, we do accept in neonatology a bit higher CO2 levels and we keep winning with higher CO2 levels as far as the pH is okay. Okay with the extubating at 50 or 40, 50? Oh yeah, you know, uh, I think you know it, it depends pretty much on your pH. Um, the people keep looking um, to the CO2 all the time, but the CO2 uh, is not the main thing. The main thing is the pH. Uh, so if you have a, I'll give you an example. If you have a CO2 of 60 with a pH of 740, uh, it's different than if you have a six, CO2 of 60 with a pH of 7.1. Yeah, sure. So a CO2 of 60 with the pH of 7.1, that's respiratory acidosis. I would not advise you to extubate this patient. I think Dr. Right? Henry must have got his answer uh, by now. Uh, Dr. Henry. Uh, Dr. Vijay Gupta is yeah. another interesting person. He's asking you a very pertinent question. In fact, from your presentation itself, uh, that uh, the, the failure rate of within 24 hours actually increased the odds ratio of mortality and BPD kind of thing. So he's asking, what is the best time to extubate an extremely preterm baby on ventilatory favorable setting and the baby's cardio, uh, cardio respiratory stable? Less than 24 hours or more than, uh, less than 48 hours or more than 48 hours? And another question he's asking, Dr. Vijay Gupta, is uh, whether uh, trying SBT, spontaneous uh, breath trial, uh, is spontaneous generation of tidal volume and spontaneous respiratory rate on pressure support ventilation is a better indicator for extubation readiness? No, you have a model. Uh, no, you, you, you would always like us to follow that model. I don't know. I, I'm going to ask, how can we replicate that model in our setup, which is difficult for us right now. But actually, these two questions of SBT, as uh, you can see the questions in the uh, QA also, uh, he has asked two okay. questions. So let me see if I can see it. So, Dr. Uh, uh, there are two questions. questions. The last questions. Uh, the best time to Dr. Vijay Gupta. Best time to extubate a e uh, EPT baby on ventilatory febrile settings and cardio we, we don't know the best time. The best time is, uh, um, I, I would say, like I said before, I think the best time is in the first week of life, but it depends on each case. Um, we try in neonatology to have one thing for everybody, but it's very difficult um, because uh, each patient is different. 
uh, as a general rule, um, the best idea is early and successful. So uh, I we tried to get them off the ventilator in the first week of life uh, and make sure that they're going to be successful. And because you have actually uh, showed uh, the the survey uh, from the uh, the various centers. In fact, Peter Davis is there. Uh, there's Martin Kessler is there. So many uh, these uh, the experts are there, and they have different days of when they would like to extubate. And your coin trial and IPPV oh. actually was an average of three to twenty-five days, uh, two point five yeah. to thirty-six days of. Uh, yeah, the average is in the most people is in the there, most yeah. studies on the first week of life, between three and seven days. I think that's the most common practice. The problem uh, is to identify those who will fail. Because those that those that fail, they are early extubated uh, in a very fragile time of their life and fail. Well, there are good questions Both of them coming. Have uh, higher chances of morbidity. Girme, there are a lot of good questions coming. And Mustafa Ali, I don't know, he's uh, also from some part of the world. And uh, is there any effects <laughs> of sedation drugs on extubation failure? Um, are you using any sedation drugs? Uh, I think. Uh, what is your answer? Are you using? Can you say it again because I could not hear you well. Is there any effects of sedation drugs on extubation failure? Oh, oh yeah, no, but uh, we don't. Um, we does. don't have any. It was a criteria for the apex, and we don't extubate. Um, we talk about preemies, extremely preterm babies, no surgical case, and etc. So we don't sedate them for ventilation. Uh, so uh, Doctor Germe, uh, there is a Brian called asking you, what is your opinion about PC, MMV plus VG uh, in order to wean a baby? That, that is mandatory minute volume plus volume guarantee. Uh, to in order to, so he's now coming to ventilation. Uh, how do you wean? Yeah. We, in our place, um, just be clear that we did not look into that into the APEX study. The patients were ventilated. It was a very pragmatic study. So we did not change the way the units were doing the the, the ventilation. In our unit, we use volume guarantee uh, with the VN500. Uh, there's some data there uh, in systematic review showing that winning with VG is quicker than with pressure control. And I think it's probably related to automated winning when you have the VG, the pressures come down by itself as the compliance gets better uh, compared to uh, need someone to go there and do it for you uh, in the pressure control mode. So. I think the volume guarantee mode um, is associated with faster winning. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, um, but I know, I, have, yeah. I just want to highlight that win is one thing. Once you get to the winning numbers you like, X to bait is another thing. Uh, there are patients that are winnable, you get to numbers that you are okay, and you oh. X to bait and they fail. Hello. Uh, and uh, the patients that do well. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Shanu Chandran uh, is. Um, Hello. Yeah. So, Dr. Shanu Chandran is asking, what is the role of ventilator graphics? Uh, yeah. Very good. Compliance in PV loop and ventilator der derived measurements like C20 by C, which is which we see R and RVR, which we see in our dragger. Uh, at times in predicting extubation readiness in extremely preterm. Uh, what oh, they use as, as, far as, as far as I know, there's no good data on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, if yeah. someone wants to do a study, it would be great uh, to look. It's a difficult study to be done, but uh, you know. Um, but as far as I know, there is uh, no good data on that. It's a very interesting question by Dr. Prakash Kabur, and he has actually. Uh, uh, he's now trying to imply to you, and in fact, he's asking you, do you agree to keep the babies electively intubated for a week if they are less than 600 to 700 grams and close to one kg weight? Are you putting up a duration that this baby will be intubated for uh, or ventilated for one week? Can, can you, can you rephrase? Do you, agree, do you agree to keep the babies electively intubated for about a week if they are less than 600 to 700 gram and close to one kg in weight? Uh, no, um, 
I would not say we had a, a number of babies less than a kilo and less than a week successfully extubated. Uh, I wish it was simple like that. Um, unfortunately, it's not. Uh, again, every case is different. So we need to find a way. I think, honestly, the future for that complex situation would be to have a very good collaboration with biomedical engineer and computer science and get all the signals of the patient and then go in the individual level with a machine learning thing that can help the physicians. We are still better than machines up to date, but that doesn't mean that we're gonna be better than them forever. It's just that there are not enough studies that have explored that avenue. And I think the apex classifier is probably the first step to show, look, there's another way we can do things uh, more sophisticated in the beginning, but then, you know, technology evolves so quick that it may be expensive now and in a year may be very cheap uh, and very simple. So it just needs to be done. Mm. Uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. fine. So, so thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Best. And uh, you know, it has been a wonderful listening to Professor Galhame. Now, uh, there are some more questions left, you know, and. Uh, if we don't answer them, people will feel a little less satisfied and we have such a resource available with us. And these are more practice questions. And there are many times people have asked in this question box today about the use of steroid. I am again directly asking you. Uh, yeah. Any extubation role of steroid? Yeah. Your, your yeah. experience, your comment. Yeah. Um, uh, it's steroids for sure, you know, um, decrease mortality, uh, uh, accelerates winning, from mechanical ventilation uh, and, you know, and then more babies get extubated. Uh, we, we were curious about that, whether steroids would um, decrease extubation failure. Uh, and uh, when we looked into the babies extubated after the first week of life, uh, between one week and three weeks, those are the ones that most of the time uh, are on steroids to get extubated because we don't give steroids in the first week of life. So it's after the first week of life. Surprisingly, there was no difference between no, babies on steroids. We had babies on steroids that failed and that babies on steroids that were successfully extubated. Uh, but uh, you no, know, we certainly, if there's a lot of lung disease uh, and this kid is uh, uh, stuck on the ventilator, there's, we can't win the baby. A baby is very unstable. If I were to going up and down, a lot of oxygen. Steroids help quite a lot to get them off the machine. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Uh, the other question which people are asking in a different way is what practice you have as far as the peri-intubation care is concerned, peri-extubation care is concerned. Before, during, and after extubation, what are your SOPs? Uh, just bullets so for our practice points. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, well, need to be clinically stable, hemodynamically stable. Uh, most of the yeah. time, uh, not on uh, inotropes or, or not under suspected infection and etc. On caffeine, uh, they are extubated. You know, we, I, if you are extubating a baby that's less than a thousand, I highly recommend that you do that during the daytime, where everybody is there in the unit. Yes. You prepare ahead of time. You have all the good people around. Um, we ask the physicians, don't, don't order an extubation and go away. I stay. When I extubate these babies and I stay at the bedside during the procedure uh, and then make sure to extubate them and put them on non-invasive support right after. And as I mentioned before, we put them on the bubble CPAP system. And if they are not doing well, uh, and having apnea, then we switch to NIMV or NIPPV. So um, those are the practice that we do. Um, there's another things, other things I've learned. Now we stop the feeds two hours before. Uh, and the reason why we stop the feeds is because if you don't want them to vomit and then aspirate the, the whole procedure. And they usually leave them without feeding a few hours after, because when you take the endotracheal tube out, uh, the vocal cords movement take time to go back to normal. So basically the vocal cords are not in full uh, motion range. 
So if the baby va uh, vomit, because you're feeding and the baby vomit, there's a chance that the milk can go inside. So uh, I also do that. But that's our center, not evidence-based center practice. Uh, some people have asked about uh, role of, you know, mm, some uh, nebulizations, maybe medicated or just a steam nebulization or mucolytics. So your take on that? No, we, we don't use mucolytics. Um, nebulization, uh, I understand that nebulization with, uh, if it's bronchodilators, we don't use. Um, if it's nebulization okay. with uh, epi to decrease the airway, swallowing or a airway edema and that's maybe the reason why the steroids question came up um, we do not know for sure how many kids had significant upper airway obstruction after extubation those babies this is a study that i'm i'm dying to do i really want to do that now i know that columbia in new york they scope all babies prior to extubation so you know, as a matter of fact they, they put the laryngoscope and they extubate under direct visualization. And, and Dr. Wong tells me that in a few patients, when they take the endotracheal tube out, they see a lot of airway edema. Uh, and then some, I, I'm sure that some of these tiny babies, they fail extubation because of airway obstruction. It's just that, you know, a 600, 700 gram baby would not show stridor to you. They're just going to have apnea. Uh, and then when you go to reintubate them, you see a lot of like a cherry airway, a lot of swelling and edema. So that's something that needs to be uh, better studied. It's another uh, factor in this complex equation. Uh, quickly, since we have asked you a lot of questions, two more quick questions, uh, which you would like you to respond, please, if you don't mind. Uh, no. One is, you know, the position of the baby, post extubation position. Uh, do you take care of any shoulder elevation or prone position? What is your thought on this? Yeah, it's important when you're giving, yeah, yeah. If you're giving non-invasive support, we pay a very, very close attention that the airway is open. Uh, you know, these babies are very hypotonic, so it's very easy to do that. So you need to have an open airway. It's a position that you have a very nice open airway. Can we put these babies on prone position? The answer is yes. Does prone position helps into ventilation and oxygenation? Yes. Uh, you have a more stable chest wall. You have a better aeration yeah. of the non-dependent areas of the lung. So we flip them. Uh, so every time the nurses go to do the handling and the care, they change right side, left side, prone position. And in many babies, when we notice that they are much more stable on the prone position, we use to keep them on the front position longer. Uh, Dr. Gilbane, sorry, uh, can I just, uh, Mayank yeah. is uh, from uh, uh, Ames Rishikesh, I think, Mayank Priyadarshi, sir. Uh, and he wants to know, why do you think that extubation was so low in APEC study compared to 60% in other studies? Oh, I don't know. I can tell you that. Some How can you tell that? <laughs> uh, it, it, no, it was... Uh, 18% based on 72 hours. Yeah. Uh, so if we extended that to seven days as the definition, it was 27%. No, it was higher. And so that like comes said, you know, it, it depends on how you define. Um, so um, some studies um, have reported 40, 50, 60% extubation <laughs> freedom rate. I do suspect um, that either because they're extubating babies from higher ventilation settings or they not have the same expertise and keep them off uh, on non-invasive support, you know. But if you, there, there were six centers involved in the APEX study, six, uh, and there's highly variable. I, uh, each center has a different percentage of extubation failure rate, uh, some the double of the other one. So this is the overall of the whole so we have few doubters uh, again. Dr. Kavita Shikumar, she is a professor in uh, Goa Medical College. I think she's the same, Kavita. Kavita, you're the same, I think. Uh, what was the mean age of babies who were successfully extubated in APEC study? So I think that yeah, was- Yeah, I presented. It was uh, 20. 26 or 27 weeks. So you had 25 versus 26 or 27? 25 was the failure. So 25 yeah. was the failure and 26 and something was a success. Yeah, it was a one week difference. 
Uh, but again, this is a, uh, you know, preliminary. Uh, now we have the final numbers. I have to go back and see the table. Uh, okay. That number I presented was the PAS presentation based on 207 patients. We finished with 241 patients. Okay, uh, possibly the last question I would ask you, and again, this is, you know, people are asking about role of side breath or somebody has asked even nasal HFO. Uh, so any experience or comments on this? No, um, we, I heard, you know, uh, Surrender mentioned that, you know, some centers are using nasal high frequency ventilation. Um, we have never used that, you know, our high frequency CPAP is bubble CPAP uh, because the bubble CPAP creates a lot of oscillation and a high frequency. Uh, and it's about 30 Hertz. It's higher than the ventilator and it costs a hundred dollars. And the high frequency ventilator is very expensive. Uh, so um, the other issue, uh, so I have no experience because we have never used myself. The other issue is that, you know, to really ventilate with nasal high frequency ventilation you have to use very low Hertz. It's about six Hertz uh, and humidification becomes a problem. A lot of those patients plug and obstruct the airway. And if they obstruct the airway, then you, you basically fail non-invasive support. You cannot have an airway obstruction uh, if you're not intubated. So you need to have uh, open airway. So we have never moved into that. No, I just have to say that, you know, um, we are kind of, more a conservative and simple center. We like to use first plan A simple. Uh, and if that doesn't work, then we have a plan B and C. Uh, we don't jump into new technologies. We know them, we have them. Like I said, I've done studies on high frequency, on NIVNAVA and et cetera. But um, we, most of the time, the less you do, the better. Uh, you know, and the, the more simple yeah, yeah. you go, the better for the patient. Uh, when we try to anticipate on site, too. yeah. Sorry, a, a comment on site use of side breath. Uh, no, we, um, if uh, uh, probably the question is related to jet ventilation uh, and the addition of side breaths or non Yeah, yeah. Um, well, only if there is a telectasis, uh, uh, and we okay. don't. We put the side breaths for lung recruitment, uh, for opening up the leg disease, and then uh, after that, we it, we just remove the side breaths. Okay, thank you, uh, Doctor Bist. Any other question, or should I make a final remark? Uh, Doctor Bist, there was one question which uh, yeah, was uh, just uh, can if I uh, um, this is uh, I think I think you have covered most of them, sir. There was one I uh, okay. Uh, yeah, sure. That was PDA. Something somebody was asking. So as this, uh, do do PDA figure in that uh, classifier apex classifier? If what PDA patent ductus arteriosus? Yeah, figure everything is there. Um, like I like I mentioned at the beginning, we collected eight pages of clinical data. Everything is there. PGA didn't come up with in the model. Um, we we have a unit. Now, if you have two minutes that, to talk about that, you know, I don't think it, to not do anything is right, to do everything is right. Uh, there must be some patients that will be helped by, by management of PGA. But anyway, as we don't know who are these patients, uh, a few years ago, like uh, in 2015, we basically stopped treating babies with PGA. So we don't even do the echocardiogram anymore. Um, we just don't, don't do anything. Um, and our BPG rates came down, uh, our complications, our neck, it's probably one of the lowest neck uh, rates in Canada. So um, honestly, people in my place now, more and more, they just don't, uh, not worried about the PDA anymore. That's good news for us. Few, having said that in a few patients, uh, I think, but I don't know who are these patients, uh, but I think that in a few patients, it might be significant and maybe um, might be uh, important to do something, but we don't know who are these patients and what to do. 
uh, what's the best treatment. So we're waiting for the, the group of people who have major interest and do a lot of good research on that to come up with uh, answers that we can change our practice. Manoj, sir. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, so, uh, uh, dear friends, today we have learned a lot on such an important topic of our practice. And some of the things which I thought I have learned are that number one, I must prevent extubation failure at all cost. If I reintubate and multiple reintubation, I give more morbidity and maybe mortality to my baby. And hence, I must prevent that. Well, today we don't have the best predictors, but a lot of scores are coming. Even on, I presume that it's online also available from one of the universities that you have a score available on the web page, and you can put in data and have a, some estimate. But still, everything has its own fallacy. At the time of artificial intelligence, which will give a reasonable surety, but it's a long way to go to become available for all of us. And lastly, don't be so late in your extubation before baby kicks the tube out or baby throws the endotracheal tube and he does his own spontaneous uh, extubation. So thank you very much uh, for an excellent talk and whatever uh, tremendous learning and very grateful. Over to Dr. Manoj, please. Thank you so much, Professor Gileen Santana. Uh, today's talk was a class apart and I'm sure all of us have benefited profusely from this lecture. It is very surprising like to hear that precision medicine has invaded pulmonary neonatal care as well. Well, uh, and uh, on a personal note, as I was mentioning previously, we hope to see you in person next year uh, in September 2021 in Kerala for our national conference IAP Neocon 2021. Thank you, sir. Thank Let you, guys. Thank you for your patience. and. Thank you for uh, doing, uh, organizing this webinar. That's uh, amazing. It will for sure benefit a lot of people. Thank you so much. Let me also thank the moderators, Surgeon Rear Admiral Professor Girish Gupta and Dr. Surinder Singh Bisht for having led the discussion so officially on such a complex topic as extubation readiness. Thank you so much. And finally, friends, thank you so much for joining this session. We hope to see you again on 18 November for discussions on another novel concept, multi-omics approach in perinatology and neonatology. And this talk is going to be by the true legend in that field of multi-omics, Professor Joseph New from US. Please do join us on 18. And on that note, let us say goodbye. goodbye. Thank you.